With an unwavering gaze, Peterson unveils the harsh reality that a lot of us have long denied. Just They're just done. They go from barely hanging on to not hanging on. And their kids go from having some ghost of a chance of opportunity to having none. Our insatiable thirst for energy, coupled with dwindling resources and a changing climate, has created the perfect storm that threatens to plunge us into darkness. Can you not see that this is going to get worse if the Deloitte-style moralists have their way? Peterson's words carry the weight of truth as he exposes the consequences of our short-sightedness. The delicate balance of our energy infrastructure is crumbling. It's like, you really think that all of our problems can be reduced to excess carbon dioxide production? We have other problems. Well, here's a problem. 20 million people die a year because of indoor pollution. It's not just a matter of inconvenience, it's survival. Peterson's voice trembles with the gravity of the situation as he illuminates the far-reaching implications of the crisis. From skyrocketing energy prices to widespread blackouts that cripple economies and sow chaos. This winter, tens of millions of British citizens, including children, will be tipped or dumped into energy poverty severe enough to risk permanent damage to their health. Cold, damp houses provide the perfect breeding ground for mold that not only causes respiratory distress, but renders houses essentially unlivable. The time for half measures and empty promises is over. Peterson's unwavering voice implores us to embrace sustainable practices, invest in renewable technologies, and cultivate a collective consciousness that values conservation and stewardship. Well, is that a problem? It's a way bigger problem than climate change by the looks of it. Is it a big enough problem? Well, if not, there's others. Lots of children are still starving. We could provide them with nutrition at a fraction of the cost that we're planning to expend not doing a very good job of mediating our carbon output. And it's very terrifying to me, it is. especially here, you know, because your energy prices have gone way out of control and that's going to hurt a lot of poor people mm -hmm. and, and certainly around the world as well. The world bank already estimated that we've put 350 million people into what they call a food insecurity. 350 million. That's three times as many as the communists managed to kill. Maybe we can manage that in a winter. But the planet has too many people on it anyway, so, you know, that's just poor people. And I could see this coming. You really saw it happening in Germany and the UK, you know, where we have this absolute rat's nest of way more expensive energy and and this is where it gets extremely perverse. You know, you might say, okay, look, we have to save the future poor. And so now some of the present poor are gonna have to suffer. Well, that's convenient for you if you happen not to be one of those poor people, but let's give the devil his due and say, okay. It's like, that'd be fine with me. Not really. That'd be fine with me if the consequence of your actions, raising energy prices, for example, actually pro produced an improvement in those things you wanted to improve. One of the things that's happening because of the pressure on liquid natural gas supplies primarily is that there's a tremendous amount of deforestation occurring in Europe at the moment because people have to turn to sources of energy that are actually at hand so that they don't freeze in the dark in the middle of the winter. I think the central issue for conservatives is to stop allowing the radicals to exploit you on the guilt front. It's like, no, you're, you're not moral because you're, you think that the apocalypse that confronts us can be reduced to a single variable, that you know what the variable is, because that's how wise you are, and that you know what the solution to that is, end all fossil. It's, the apocalypse is all carbon dioxide and the cure is end all fossil fuels. Is that, that's what you think, is it? You know what that means? That means you don't think. It doesn't mean you're moral. It certainly doesn't mean I'm immoral if I oppose you. There's way, we've got way bigger fish to fry than, than problems on the carbon dioxide front. And so the thing that I find so appalling about what's happening on the environmental front at the moment is that 
even by the metrics of the people who are pro-environmental. These policies that are driving energy costs upward are utterly counterproductive. And you know, humanprogress.org has a lovely graph showing the relationship between attention paid to true medium to long-term environmental sustainability and overall wealth. And what you see is that if you can get, as you make people wealthier, so as you remove them from absolute poverty, their ability and willingness to attend to longer term environmental issues starts to increase rather than decreasing. And so this has struck me for, I've known this for at least 10 years, that the best pathway forward to a truly sustainable planet, even by the definitions of the environmentalists themselves, is to drive energy costs downward to the point where we can remediate absolute poverty so that people aren't driven to use up um, damaging and polluting immediately available bioresources instead of turning to more efficient sources of energy. Virtue signaling utopians committed to globalization claim we are destroying the planet with cheap energy. But are they truly and deeply committed to the environmental sustainability so loudly and insistently demanded? Or are they merely hell-bent in the prototypically Marxist manner in taking revenge on capitalism. It appears to be the latter. Why otherwise would the mavens of the environmental movement oppose nuclear power, despite its optimal carbon footprint? Why would they demonize the exceptionally clean natural gas whose fracking enabled production has allowed the US to dramatically cut the very carbon output that is so hypothetically undesirable? Utility bills have soared in the UK, the home of the Industrial Revolution that lifted the world out of poverty. Now, up to half of small businesses in Britain face the risk of bankruptcy and closure. The government has had to announce a ruinously expensive energy price guarantee to mitigate the worst effects of this disaster. The rush to renewables. Here we are. Yeah facing a very dire winter, hoisted on the petard of our own foolishness and moral presumption. We're saving the planet. We'll see, I don't think so. It doesn't look like it to me. And this is, this is the most catastrophic issue here. Assuming that we're facing an environmental crisis of planetary proportions, which is not something I buy, by the way, assuming we are, well then I would imagine that you would put in place measures that would ameliorate that problem instead of exacerbating it. But all the measures you're putting in place are actually making the environmental problem worse. So how is that even vaguely acceptable? And I look at that and I think, oh, I see. It's just like George Orwell said about middle-class socialists 50 years ago. It's not that you love the planet, it's that you hate humanity. So for example, energy is more expensive, but now the air is cleaner. But that isn't what's happened in Germany. Right. What's happened in Germany is energy is like five times as expensive and the coal plants are back on. So it's like, even by your own criteria for success, you failed and you did it at the expense of the poor. And you know, the World Bank estimated, I don't remember how many months ago, it's probably nine months ago, that we're putting 350 million people at, on the brink of starvation because we're cranking energy prices up. And so for me, it's like, that's 350 million people. That's three times as many as the communists killed, you know, in their six decades of trying. And if, you're, if your cure for the planet is, well, you know, we got to put 350 million poor people in jeopardy just so that things are hypothetically better in 100 years, I think, yeah, I don't think so, buddy. And also, it's a little bit too convenient for me that your prescriptions to save the planet are accompanied by this insistence that the only way forward to that is to give you all the power. It's like, mm. there's a bit of a moral hazard in that, don't you think? It's like, I'm just saving the planet. Give me all the power. It's like, you want to save the planet or do you want the power? And let's, let's put the first, the second one first because the probability that you're a saint or the Messiah is pretty damn low. If you're seeking the cause of the Dutch agriculture and fisheries protests, the Canadian trucker convoy, or before that, the rise of the so-called yellow jackets in France, the farmer rebellion in India a few years ago, 
the recent catastrophic collapse of Sri Lanka, or the energy crises in Europe and Australia, you can instruct yourself by the recent pronouncements from Deloitte. The International Energy Agency recently indicated that two decades of intense support for such undertakings has hiked the proportion of energy provided by such means from 13 to 14% to an utterly underwhelming 15.7%. If all governments deliver on their current climate policies, the world will derive no more than 28% of its energy that way by 2050 and 100% by 2207. Not 2030 or 2035, but 200 years later. Does anyone on the liberal left accept such projections? Or are they a mere fabrication of the conspiratorial right-wing conservative imagination? How about the Biden administration? Biden's experts, no doubt motivated to be as optimistic as possible, project that a mere 27% of the energy produced by 2050 will be carbon dioxide free and that full CO2 eradication cannot possibly occur until 2242. 2242, an even more dismal guesstimation if you regard such realities as dismal than that put forth by the International Energy Agency. The one thing the Deloitte models guarantee is that if we do what they recommend, we will definitely be poorer than we would have been otherwise for an indefinite but hypothetically transitory period. Yet, any reduction in economic output, however temporary and necessary, will be purchased at the cost of the lives of those who are barely making it now. Period. Have you all noticed that food has become much more expensive? That shelter has become much more expensive? That energy is more expensive? That many consumer goods are simply unavailable? Can you not see that this is going to get worse if the Deloitte-style moralists have their way? How much short-term pain are you going to be required to sustain? Decades worth? All your life and the life of your children? It's very likely for your own benefit. Remember that. And all this painful privation is not only not going to save the planet, it's going to make it far worse. It leaves me open-mouthed in amazement that we in the developed world, with our functional economies and our high level of luxury and security, can say to developing worlds, the developing world, well, you know, we've got it pretty good here and we're probably willing to cut back a little bit, but you guys down there in the developing countries, you know, you should be pretty damn careful about your carbon output. We're not going to help you develop your economy so that you can benefit from the same industrial revolution that, have, that, has, that, has, that has enabled us to educate our children and to have plenty to eat and to be warm in the winter and cool in the summer. And then what's all even more preposterous is it's the very people who are constantly clamoring about the oppressive nature of Western culture who are foisting this very story on these developed countries. I learned that the fastest and most certain pathway forward to the future we all want and need, peaceful, prosperous, beautiful, is through the economic elevation of the absolutely poor. Richer people care about the environment, which is, after all, all that is outside the primary and fundamental concern of those desperate for their next meal. Make the poor rich and the planet will improve or at least get out of their way while they try to make themselves rich. 
make the poor poorer. And this is the concrete plan, remember. And things will get worse, perhaps worse beyond imagining. Observe the chaos in Sri Lanka, if you need proof. There are clearly more important priorities than costly and ineffective emergency climate change reductions. We could admit instead that the rest of the planet's inhabitants have the right and the responsibility to move toward the abundant material life that we have enjoyed despite ourselves for the last century and which has been so entirely dependent on industrial activity and fossil fuel usage. We could work diligently and with purpose to drive energy and food prices down to the lowest level possible so that we can ease the burden on the poor and open up their horizons of possibility so that they become concerned as they inevitably and properly will with long-term sustainability instead of acting desperately and destructively in pursuit of their next meal. In a world filled with self-help gurus and motivational speakers, Jordan Peterson's voice rises above all that noise. You figure out what went wrong when something went wrong so you don't duplicate it in mm. the future. Unveiling a simple yet profound truth that has the power to transform lives. To become the person that you want to be, you got to confront the chaos within and embrace the responsibility that lies before you. The, the second part of the program helps people do an analysis of their virtues and their faults. Peterson's words penetrate the very core of our being, urging us to embark on a journey of self-discovery and personal growth, where, where the path to transformation begins with an honest appraisal of our weaknesses and our shortcomings. When you were starting to talk in your relationship in a more truthful manner, what did that mean that you had to admit? I mean, you just said that part yeah. of it was a disconnect between who you were trying to be and who you really were. So that's a persona yeah. issue, right? So With each carefully chosen word, Peterson illuminates the power of taking control of our lives, revealing that the key lies not in external validation or superficial success, but in the unwavering commitment to face our fears. I don't want to calculate high-resolution utopia for myself only to have it squandered by fortune. How do I ensure the meaning I experience is self-determined? Well, you can't because there's an arbitrary element to existence, so it is going to be squandered to some degree by fortune. But that's, that's not the point. What are you going to do? Just sit back on your laurels and wait for things to roll over you? Peterson's insights resonate with an unwavering conviction. For he understands that the journey towards becoming the person we aspire to be is fraught with challenges, setbacks, and moments of doubt. You think maybe, and everyone has this proclivity to some degree, is they're deeply um, self-conscious and uncertain. And so instead of allowing the person they're with to connect with that underlying uncertainty and inadequacy, they act out a persona. Yeah. And then the problem is, is that, well, perhaps the person falls in love with that persona, but there's no real connection there. It's, it's an artifice. It is through this crucible of self-reflection and growth that we forge the strength and resilience that we need to transcend our limitations. Well, yeah. the suffering is pain, and the suffering is anxiety and uncertainty, and the suffering is hopelessness, but the consequence of all that is that you get bitter. And mm. when you get bitter, you get mean, and you get cruel, and you start to hurt yourself and other people. What you do, look, the hero myth basically says, <clears throat> go out there, confront the dragon, get the gold, share it with the community, and, and, and live properly. Or it says, the alternative is, Face the tyrant, <clears throat> enter the desert as a consequence because everything falls apart. So it's not only that if you don't have a goal, you suffer, it's that you, if you don't have a goal, you suffer and then you get cruel and bitter and resentful and then you start to actively try to make the world a worse place. Mm. And so, so because you can't <clears throat> suffer pointlessly without becoming bitter and you can't become bitter without becoming cruel. What is the consequence, the long-term consequence of acting? So many people, especially because of the world I live in, in Instagram and in social media, we, we kind of build out these personas and then yeah. we almost follow the implicit instructions that come with those personas. Well, so that's the problem right there is that, well, that, that I'm trying to get a hold of the Disney people at the moment because I want to do a lecture series on Pinocchio because I think Pinocchio is brilliant work of art. 
Um, and if you're a puppet and an actor, and Pinocchio is both at times in that movie, both a puppet and an actor. So why an actor? Like, why is there, why is there something wrong with being an actor? Well, the first question is, well, who sets your role? And then the second question is, who's pulling your strings? So you've put on this front that is there to make you popular and sexy and desirable and to mask from yourself your own inadequacies. But that's a role. Well, who wrote it? And for what purpose? And so Jung said, for example, that we all acted out a myth, and whether we knew it or not. And, you know, maybe you're acting out a tragedy. Maybe you're acting out Narcissus. You don't know because you've put that you've put that on yourself in an attempt in some ways to deliver to people what they want or more accurately to look as though you're delivering to people what they want and it's not nothing to do that right because at least you're attempting in some sense to adapt to the social world someone who's really infantile and dependent someone who's never left home part of their problem is that they haven't crafted a persona so you don't want to denigrate it entirely but it's no substitute for the real thing. And it turns out that not only is what we want from each other the real thing, but that's also the adventure of your life. And so if you aren't truthful, and that means, unfortunately, especially at the beginning, when you start to be truthful, it means deeply coming to terms with your inadequacies in humility. We have a program. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things I wanted to talk to you about yeah. today. I, I have this website called selfauthoring.com and that program helps people write about their life. And so there's a past authoring program. To, to, to establish your aim, you have to know where you are. It's like you're trying to orient yourself on a map. You can't orient yourself on a map unless you know where you are. You yeah. also have to know where you're going, right? So those are the two relevant things. The past authoring program helps people write about their lives. So it's a guided autobiography. We ask people to break their life up into six epochs, six sections, and then to write about the emotionally important events in those, in those epochs and to detail out why, why the positive things happened and why more of that could conceivably happen in the future and to detail out why the negative things happened and to try to understand why with an aim to not replicating them in the future because the purpose of memory isn't to remember the past. The purpose of memory is so that you you figure out what went wrong when something went wrong so you don't duplicate it in the mm. future. So that's yeah. the purpose of memory. And the past authoring program can help people catch up. And you know you have to catch up if you have memories that are older than about a year and a half that still cause you emotional pain when you mm. think about them. Or if you dwell on them, they come spontaneously back to mind. It means you haven't, it means that there's part of your life that you haven't mapped out properly and it still has emotional valence that's gripping you. You're still you holding on to that story. Or it's yeah. still holding on to you. Mm, interesting. Right, you haven't right. let it go. Yeah, yeah. well, you haven't been able to navigate your way through it. You, there's a pitfall there that you fell in, and you don't know how to avoid similar pitfalls in the future, and that's why so your you brain won't it. let it go. Because oh. it's saying that's what the anxiety systems do. It's like, this happened to you, it wasn't good. This happened to you, it wasn't good. This happened to you, it wasn't good. Fix it, fix it, fix it, fix it. That will never go away unless you fix it. And so that's a massive, massive advantage. Look, Will Ferrell, um, Warren Ferrell, not the comedian, Warren Ferrell, the author, he outlined data in Why Men Earn More, which is a book I would recommend, by the way, showing that if you work 13% longer hours, you make 40% more money. It's nonlinear. So you think, why is that? Well, imagine you had 10 employees and one of them works an extra 10%. It's not much. Well, how often is that person going to be promoted assuming you have a clue as a boss it's like you're going to look at the 10 people and you're going to think oh that guy's always here like 45 minutes early it's like why don't we give him the promotion obviously right so these tie these small edges that you can manage like that work an extra 10 percent or extra 13 percent have non-proportional payoffs that's part of the pareto distribution so get get your sleep cycle Organize so you get up in the morning. Learn how to do it. No excuses. I'm too tired in the morning. I don't like mornings. Who cares? That's not relevant. It's like discipline yourself so you can manage it. Schedule your meals because that's a good disciplinary routine. And then learn to use a calendar like Google Calendar. Most of you, many of you out there do not use a calendar. Okay, a calendar is not a prison and it's not a tyrant. Not if you use it properly. A calendar keeps anxiety at bay. 
It makes sure that you do what you need to do, which is important because otherwise you fall behind. But if you use it properly, it also helps you plan what you want to do. So I could say, well, lay out your damn calendar and design the days you would like to have. That's what your calendar is, ha is for. So you can put in all sorts of things in there you want to do and that would be good for you. And that's a really good, a really good way to start being more industrious. Make a plan. You need a plan for three years. You need a plan for the next year. You need a plan for the next six months. You need a plan for the next three months. You need a plan for the week. You need a plan for the day. You need a plan for the hour. All of that, all of that. I make lists constantly of what I have to do. You have to figure out why it happened, right? That's the first thing is like, how did you, how was it that that situation arose to pull you down? Mm -hmm. And that's not simple. That's why, well, that's why we have the writing program because right. it's complicated to think <clears throat> it through. But, you, but if you face it and you, and you meditate on it, let's say, and, so, and you do this voluntarily, there's a pretty high probability that you'll be able to decrease the probability that will be repeated in the future. So, and this, and, <clears throat> go ahead, I don't want to cut you Oh, well, well we, the, the second part of the program helps people do an analysis of their virtues and their faults. Mm -hmm. Same sort of idea. What's good about you that you could capitalize on? What's weak about you that you need to fix so that it doesn't bring you down? Right? And that's the present authoring, but the future authoring program is probably most relevant to mm. you and your listeners because you're interested in helping people establish aims. And so we already talked about the fact that you need an aim in life or, or that's where you derive your meaning. And without that, things go to hell and, and as literally as that can be taken. And so, but it's not easy to, to ask people to say, well, it's easy to ask them, what do you want in your life? It's a very hard question to answer because it's too right. vague right, right, and, right. and grand. Eh? So we help in the future authoring program, we help people break that down. It's okay, so here, here's the situation. So you put yourself in the right frame of mind. So what's the right frame of mind? It's like rule two in this book. Treat yourself like you're someone responsible for helping. You're someone that you are responsible for helping. So what that means is you have to start from the presupposition that despite all your flaws and insufficiencies, that it's worth having you around and that it would be okay if things were better for you. So you need to take care of yourself like you're taking care of someone you care for. So there's a bit of a detachment in that. And then the next thing is, okay, so now look three to five years down the road. Okay, you get to have what you need and want, assuming you're being reasonable mm -hmm. and that you actually want it, which means you're willing to make the sacrifices that would, that would make it possible. Let's say you believe that you're undervalued at work, and maybe you are. What you need to do is you have something to say, and we would have to figure out what it is that you have to say. But it would be some variant of, I'm bringing more value to the table than I'm being compensated for, and that's demoralizing me. And it's also not good for you, you being my boss, because if I'm actually more valuable than is being recognized, then the fact that you're not valuing me properly means that I will become demoralized, I won't work properly, and you won't get the best out of me. So it's bad for both of us. And if your boss is in principle not amenable to such a discussion, then what you should seriously consider doing is finding another job. Okay, so let's say we're going to set you up for this. Okay, this isn't like next week's enterprise, man. This is your life. So the first thing I would ask is, well, do you have your resume or CV in order? Well, I haven't typed it up for three years. Well, what do you think about bringing it up? Well, I'm pretty nervous about that because there's some holes in it and, you know, I didn't do so well in college and I'm kind of embarrassed about my resume. It's like, okay, bring it in. Let's go through it. Let's, let's, let's at least update it. Let's look where the holes are. Let's look at where the inadequacies are as far as you're concerned, right? This isn't my judgment, it's your judgment. Let's walk through those judgments and see if they're warranted because maybe you're just too guilty and ashamed and self-conscious and anxious and you're not, you're looking at your resume more critically than someone else would. And maybe there's some holes that you need to rectify. And they're like daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. Right now I can't look out more than about six months, you know, because my life is too complicated and chaotic. But, but you need a vision of who you could be, what character you could have. Three to five years out, you can't, go much farther than that because life is too unpredictable I think to make vision that's longer term than that subject to 
There's too, too much chance associated with it to spend a lot of time on. Maybe you can stretch it to five years, and in rare cases, you can have a 10-year goal, but it has to be pretty low resolution. But you want plans at all those levels of resolution. You want to write the things down. And what? Because what are you going to do? Are you going to stumble around and get, get what you need? Are you going to stumble around and be useful to other people? And it's useful to be useful to other people, you know? They want to work with you then. They want to do things with you. They want to have you around. They trust you. They open up opportunities for you. And if you stumble around like you're blind, you're not going to get anywhere. And then you're going to suffer. And then you're going to be bitter. And then you're going to be cruel. So that's, a, that's hell. That's a bad outcome. So unless you want that, don't aim for it. And, or, or aim for the opposite, because that's how you get out of it. So, physical attractiveness is extensively studied in departments of psychology. How big of a determinant of success is it apart from IQ or any of the other big five traits? Um, that's tough one, because physical attractiveness is a very complex trait. Um, it's also, for example, it's a marker of health. And of course, health is a, mar is a prerequisite for success. So. Um, I, you can't take attractiveness as a unitary dimension and measure it sufficiently accurately. Wait, I should back up on that. No one that I know of has taken physical attractiveness as a unitary concept, measured it accurately, and then pitted it against IQ and the big five to see if it, to what degree it adds incremental validity to the prediction of long-term success.